Hello to everyone. Welcome to a very new podcast celebrating Jesus in the biblical feasts. This is your pastor, Yeti. Welcome to everyone who is interested in the biblical feast of Jesus. We can celebrate Jesus in this special biblical feast and we're going to do a a very in-depth discovery. For those who are interested in the Jewish tradition, I think that this would be very welcoming. But for us, it's also very important as Christians to come to know the better understanding of what God was planned in the very beginning of a covenant in the Old Testament, as we recall it, and then a new covenant brought by Jesus Christ. So, everyone is welcome. And today I only going to do the introduction because the lessons are quite something to experience and I don't want to overload all of you. So everyone there, the seeker, the ones who are doubting, the ones who wants to dig deeper in the Old Testament and learning about feasts and calendars are very welcome. All of you are welcome. Paul said, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. Romans 15 verse 4 By celebrating Jesus in the feast, we can learn more fully what Jesus has done for us and how to walk with him in our everyday life. But before we start this introduction, I will pray this powerful blessing into your lives. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So come with me through the first episode of our new session celebrating Jesus in the biblical feast pictures of a person I'm sure you have heard the expression a picture is worth a thousand words what do we mean by this simply that we can more clearly communicate our thoughts and concepts with the use of visual ads than we can with words alone. For example, if you want to teach a child the alphabet, you don't begin by giving the child a lecture on the theory of language. The child would not be able to understand what you are talking about. Instead, you give the child a block with a letter carved on it. The block is a visual aid to teach the child how to recognize a particular letter of the alphabet. As the child learns, you give him or her more blocks with other letters until eventually the child has one block for each letter of the alphabet. Soon the child is able to put these blocks together in correct sequences as they 
correspond to the alphabet and make up single words. The child has now learned the ABCs. The blocks are visual ads used as object lessons to teach the child the alphabet. In today's world, parents also use computers in place of their physical blocks. But the, princ the principle is the same, only now the blocks are electronics. The child learns to point to the picture of the letter on the computer or tablets. A computer tutorial communicates to the child if he or she gave the right answer. God's visual ads. In the Bible, God often used visual ads as object lessons to teach us spiritual truths that he wanted us to understand. God used these visual ads as pictures in much the same manner that we would use the blocks to teach our children the alphabet. God has done this because in our fallen, sinful condition. I'm not judging. It's just an expression how God will fill in to help us in the way he teaches us and using vis visual ads. It is difficult for us to understand spiritual truths. We receive things through our physical senses much more clearly than we do through our spiritual senses. In view of this, when God began to teach his covenant people, the Jews, he did so through the use of visual ads or pictures that the Jews could comprehend what their physical sense, with their physical senses. God gave these pictures in the, Bible, in the Hebrew Bible in the form of the various re religious laws and rituals that the Jews were to observe. I will be using the term Hebrew Bible rather than Old Testament throughout these sessions we're going to go through together. As the Jews practice these laws and rituals, they would learn spiritual truths concerning their relationship with God through their physical senses. For 1,500 years, the Jewish people learned about the one true God through their visual ads. Their religious laws and rituals taught them how to know God and walk with Him on a daily basis. They also pointed they also pointed them to the Messiah. But just as the child's blocks are not the real alphabet, neither were their physical pictures complete in themselves. They were important, but they were only pictures. A step further, the ultimate visual ad. After centuries of looking at the pictures, the time came when the Jews were to enter into the spiritual reality of these visual ads. The transition from the physical to the spiritual was provided for them through Jesus of Nazareth, the Jewish Messiah and Savior of the world. While the Hebrew scriptures provided the pictures, the New Testament provided the person. In other words, the pictures 
in the Hebrew Bible pointed to the person in the New Testament. This picture to person connection is what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 5, 17 to 18, when he said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one yacht or one title will be no, by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Because the common Western understanding of fulfill means done away with, Christians have believed that Jesus meant the pictures pointed to him were no longer needed. This is not what Jesus meant. We have to understand his words in the context of his Jewish culture and customs. Every time when biblical scholars or any theologian or any other person takes scriptures out of the context, it's a wrongdoing. It's very wrong. To Jewish Bible teachers and rabbis in the time of Jesus, the word that is translated into English as fulfilled means the true or corrected interpretation of Scripture, while the word destroy means to give a false or incorrect interpretation. These words were used in a technical sense by the Jewish religious leaders when arguing over the correct meaning of scriptures. In New Testament times, Jewish Bible teachers and rabbis, like Christian Bible teachers and ministers today, often studied the scripture together. As they discussed a certain scripture, each would give his opinion of what he thought the scripture meant. One might say, I believe the scripture means such and such. Inevitably, someone in the study group would disagree. He would then say, no, that is not correct. You are not correctly interpreting the scripture. You are doing away what are with our or with, sorry, with or destroying the scripture. Then another in the group would say, no, he is fulfilling the scripture. He is giving the true meaning of scripture. When Jesus uses the words fulfill and destroy, he was speaking in terms that were used by the religious leaders of his time. They understood exactly what he meant. He was telling them that he did not come to do any way to do away with or destroy, lead them astray by false teachings, the Hebrew scriptures. Instead, he fulfilled them as the person to whom the pictures were pointing. He was the human embodiment of their true meaning and spiritual reality. A yacht is the Hebrew character called the yacht. Y-O-D, and is the smallest of the Hebrews' alphabet. The title is a tiny mark used to distinguish certain Hebrew letters. By making such a reference, Jesus is showing how he honored and fulfilled even the last of all that was written of him in the Hebrew Scriptures. Unfortunately, we Christians living in the Western world are the ones who have unwittingly destroyed, incorrectly understood God's pictures. We have done this by interpreting the words of Jesus through the Western eyes rather than understanding Jesus as a Jewish Bible teacher of his time. 
We have done this with good intentions, but the result has been a great loss of the pictures that point us to the person. But now we are living in the most exciting time of spiritual history when God is awakening Christians around the world to the importance of understanding scriptures in their cultural context and the spiritual pictures of our Lord. I want to share a remarkable story that relates to the importance of understanding Jesus in his Jewish context. This is a true story about a young Jewish boy named Isur Danielovich. Isur was the son of a Russian Jew. He grew up in a harsh childhood of poverty in New York, where he was often tormented by the neighborhood. Christian bully. As an adult, Isur was a secular Jew who found success, fame, and wealth beyond his wilder dreams. God was definitely not a part of his life. On February 13, 1991, Isur was in a helicopter crash in which two people died, yet he miraculously survived. As he contemplated why he survived, Isur began his personal search for the meaning of life, his own relationship with God, and his identity as a Jew. As part of his search is to read the New Testament, which is a forbidden book to Jews, especially in those days. I think now Jews as of today, especially Jewish scholars, are very interesting and also study the New Testament, which is a wonderful thing that happens in our world. He explains, so how did my road back begin? Here's a shocker with Jesus. Then I found out that Jesus was a Jew. Wow. Then I found out that Jesus was not only a Jew, but a rabbi who gave sermons on the Torah. Do Christians know that? Some things that Jesus said made more sense in the context of Judaism than in Christianity. Of all the things I read of him, the one that influenced me most was this speech of Jesus recorded by the Gospel writer of Matthew. His sure then quoted Matthew 5, 17, 19. His sure Danielovich, real name is Kirk Douglas. Yes, Kirk Douglas, one of the most famous movie stars in the history of Hollywood, found his Jewish identity when he realized that Jesus is a Jewish rabbi teaching the Torah. While Kirk did not acknowledge Jesus as Messiah, he did return to his Jewish roots and found a new spirituality and purpose for his life. When we as Christians discover Jesus in his Jewish context, we too will find a new spiritual spirituality through the Torah pictures that point to him as Messiah. The pictures are powerful visuals of the person and redemptive work of Jesus. Jesus' name is Hebrew is Yeshua. 
Christ comes from the Greek word Christos and means the same as the Hebrew word for Messiah, which is Messiah. To help us keep Jesus in his Jewish context and probably connected to his pictures, I have put Jeshua, the Messiah, in brackets when our English Bible uses the name Jesus Christ. Humans need pictures to help us understand the world around us. The visual ads God gave to the Jewish people were spiritual pictures pointed them to Messiah Jesus. Jesus was God's ultimate visual ad. He was the perfect revelation of the spiritual meaning of the pictures. Jesus said to one of his followers, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, that person has come. There is no need to see God through religious rituals. In fact, God never gave the picture as objects of affection. Their purpose was to point the people to the person. That is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, for Christ, Messiah, is the end, is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The words translated into English as the end do not mean no longer needed or useful. They mean the goal. Jesus is the goal of the pictures that were pointed to him. This does not mean, however, that the pictures are no longer valuable to us. They still are important in helping us to understand how to know God and walk with Him through a personal relationship with Jesus. Simply put, we can know the person better by studying the pictures. Focusing on the pictures rather than the person is religion. Focusing on the person is relationship. We have a relationship with the person, but the pictures help us better know the person. Christians can certainly relate to the importance of spiritual pictures. For example, water, Baptism, communion, etc., are two powerful visual ads that point us to the person and work of Jesus. We outwardly express our relationship to Jesus through these rituals. The ritual pictures don't save us, but they are significant in keeping us focused on our relationship to our Lord while reminding us what he has done for us. We would never think about doing away with the pictures or that we no longer need them. The feasts of the Lord. We move on a little bit. Some of the clearest visual ads that God gives in the Bible are the biblical holy days. For centuries, Christians were told that these spiritual pictures were Jewish feasts that Jesus fulfilled, did away with. We have just learned that this is a misinterpretation of what Jesus meant. As we will see, the Bible refers to these religious holidays as the feasts of the Lord, not the feast of the Jews. Most Christians are truly surprised and amazed when they learn that God made reference to his special holy days in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis. It was the fourth day of creation where we read, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Genesis 1 14. The Hebrew word translated into English as seasons is mood, 
it's almost sounds Dutch, right, for encouragement, but M-O-E-D, mood. This word means a fixed, appointed time or season or place when God would meet with his people. It specifically refers to God's appointed biblical holiday. They are these holy festivals or feast days when the people would have a holy encounter with the living God. Mood is the same word used to refer to the Feast of the Lord in the book of Leviticus. God established these special celebrations when he brought the Hebrews out of Egypt. God spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Leviticus 23, verses 2 and 4. When we hear the word feast, we think of an elaborated meal or banquet. We tend to associate the word with food. After teaching and writing, and maybe a better understanding if we dig deeper in our study here, we will come to a better understanding. Notice that God said these are his feasts. God's covenant named in the Bible is Yahweh. These are the feasts of Yahweh. They were special holy convocations or assemblies established by God when the Jewish people would come together to meet with God in a special way. We might think of them as religious gatherings. The Hebrew word for a holy convocation or sacred assembly is mikra. This word means a dress rehearsal. The Jews would act out through the festivals and dress rehearsal for the purpose of revealing the Messiah and learning to overall redemptive and prophetic plan of God. In other words, for 1500 years, the Jews performed the drama of redemption as a picture pointed them to the person of Messiah Jesus. God appointed three feast seasons with seven individual feasts and, schedu and scheduled them on the Hebrew calendar in such a way that the Jewish would have to travel to Jerusalem three times a year to keep them. You can look this up in Exodus 23, 14 to 17 and Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. These three feast seasons were known as Passover, Pesach, Pentecost, Shavuot, and the Tabernacles, Sukkot. They portrayed and represent three major encounters with God in the lives of his covenant people. These encounters with God were for the purpose of providing his divine peace, power, and rest in their lives. Taking together, they represent seven steps in the believer's walk with God. The Feast of Passover was the first of these feast seasons. Its purpose was to teach the Hebrews how to find God's peace. Passover included the Feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. The next feast season was Pentecost. This was a single feast, and it taught the Hebrews how to receive God's power. The third feast season was called Tabernacles. The purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles was to teach the people how to enter God's rest. 
it included the Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. The Feasts of the Lord were very important visual ads for the Jewish people. Each of the seven feasts pointed them to their Messiah, and each uniquely portrayed a particular aspect of his life and ministry. Taken as a whole, they form a complete picture of the person and work of the Messiah and the steps one must take to walk in the peace, power, and rest of God. Christians have a revelation in their hearts from God's Spirit that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus not only celebrate these festivals himself, but every major redemptive event in his life also happened on a feast day. Now, since Jesus celebrated these festivals and was the spiritual reality of all of them, doesn't it seem important to learn how these pictures pointed to him and what they can mean for us? And since these are the feasts of the Lord, wouldn't it be good for all of God's covenant people to celebrate Jesus through these exciting pictures? And since we all need God's peace, power, and rest, wouldn't it be beneficial for believers to understand how the picture can help us internalizing the redemptive work of Jesus in our lives? Our world today is no different from the world of the Bible. In that we all are still seeking peace. Nations are frantically seeking peace to avoid a nuclear holocaust. Look around the world. Israel is trying in vain to live in peace with their neighbors. Individuals are seeking peace within themselves, peace with God, and peace in their relationships. We will never have peace until we submit our lives to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Feast of Passover teaches us how to have peace with God through a person relationship with Jesus as our Passover lamb. Everyone who has this personal relationship with Jesus has peace with God. That doesn't mean that your life can be upside down or you're going through tribulation times or whatever. No, that is not the peace of God because this is the reality of our own earthly life. We can have these periods in our times that like there is another season going on, a season that we have to dig deeper mm -hmm. to a better understanding in our own self or have questions about Jesus or name it. Or we have troubles and conflicts with people we work with and what name it. But unfortunately, not all followers of Jesus have the peace of God. Many believers are overcome by fear, worry, and anxiety. Through the Feast of Passover season of unleavened bread and first fruits, we not only learn how to have peace with God, but also the peace of God. We not only need God's peace, we also need God's power. The Bible and human experience tells us that mankind is hopelessly enslaved to self-destructive habits. No matter how many New Year's resolutions we make, it seems we just are not able to keep them. Sin has a hold on us, and only God can set us free. Psalm 62 verse 11 says, that power belongs to God. God has made this power available to us through Messiah Jesus. Yet not every believer is walking in the power of Jesus. Many are still overcome by sin, Satan, and the fear of death. The Feast of Pentecost teaches us how to receive the power of God 
and appropriate it in our everyday lives. We not only need God's peace and power, we also need God's rest. Our belief journey on this earth is but a fleeting moment in which we constantly war against the attacks of the world in our soul. Things don't always turn out the way we hope they will. Life is full of disappointments, heartaches, burdens, and trials. Even believers sometimes grow weary in serving God and coping with trials and struggles of life. Many are just plain worn out. The Feast of the Tabernacles teaches us how to find God's rest for our souls in this life. The quest for peace, power, and rest for our souls is surely the most elusive and difficult challenge we all face as imperfect human living in an imperfect world. Yet God has provided the means for us to live victoriously through the good and bad of life's experiences. So let's take a look at what ahead. In our next session, we will have an overview of the Biblical Jewish calendar. You might well ask yourself, what in the world does the Jewish calendar have to do with my having God's peace, God's power, and God's rest for my souls? The answer is simply that God established His appointed feast, His mood, on the Jewish calendar to be celebrated at a certain time and in a certain sequence. The reason God did this was that Jesus the, the Messiah was to fulfill them, embody their true spiritual purpose and meaning in his own less life, I mean, and ministry on the exact dates that the Jewish had been celebrating them for 1500 years. Jesus fulfilled the first two feast seasons, Passover and Pentecost. At his first coming, he will fulfill the third feast season in the tabernacles at his second coming. So don't go in there. We don't know. Only God knows when he comes back. This means there is a tremendous amount of prophetic significance in the Jewish calendar. The time and sequence of these feasts reveal the overall prophetic plan of God. As a believer, it is most important to understand the Jewish calendar for the purpose of learning how to apply the spiritual truths pictured in the feast to your personal life. As stated, they are pictures of Jesus that teach us how to know him and walk with him. Then in the following chapters, so I don't promise that we're going to have every day because this is really study work. So within the following chapters, we will study each feast in detail. We'll look back into the Hebrew scriptures and see exactly what God told the Jews to do and how they celebrate each feast. Then we will look into the New Testament and discover how Jesus fulfilled the feast. After making this connection, you will learn how to apply what Jesus accomplished for your own life. And finally, you will see how God has been restoring the spiritual realities of these feasts through the history of the church. Psalm 89 says, I mean 98, 
Verse 15 says, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. The phrase joyful sounds refers to the sounding of the shofar to call people to understand and enter into the spiritual realities of the feast. Feast in heaven and bless the person who will come with me in this new podcast celebrating Jesus in the biblical feast. I can give you some questions. Why did God use visual ads in the Hebrew Bible? The second, what did Jesus say about his relationships to Hebrew Bible and the Torah? The Torah means teaching. Another one, explain the meaning of the following Hebrew words. A. Mut, M-O-E-D. B. Mikra, M-I-K-R-A-H. And another one. What are the feasts of the Lord? Another, name the three feast seasons. And then the last one, name the seven feasts in their order of observance. So, as I said, we will go in our next podcast the biblical jewish calendar anyway so i hope this is very interesting to all of you and i hope that it will take a deeper meaning how important you are in god's eyes what god meant to restore what god gave us so we will go from the beginning celebrating Jesus in the biblical feast. May God guide you with his Holy Spirit and may you find again a new encouragement to dig deep in and may you find joy in it. So God's blessings and also in this weekend may you find rest and maybe there is some time that you can go through these lessons. May the peace of God be with you and stays with you. And may his light shine upon you and keep you safe. God's blessings. Enjoy. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye-bye.